Hello everybody, uh, we are taking a look at Elite Dangerous Horizons. This is the state of the game and a review. Now that Elite Dangerous has been out for, um, well, over a month actually, it's time to actually get a review put together for Elite Dangerous, and I'm going to go over some categories, put some points to things, use some, of course, personal opinion. Uh, this is not an endorsed review by any means, this is my own personal opinion, and it is totally snowing outside. That's pretty epic. Ignore the, out, the outside. Uh, snow means no thunder, which means no power disruption. So yes, we're going to take a look at some different categories and uh, take a look at Elite Dangerous Horizons as a complete package. Um, make a comparison or two maybe um, with respect to Elite Dangerous, the base game, and or at least some honorable mentions and stuff like that. So without much further ado, let's get started. Um, our biggest category that we're going to cover, this is going to be all the positive points that we'll be adding to our score. And we're looking for a score out of 100 here, by the way. Um, is what's in the game and reasons to play. Are the reasons that I like to play and the reasons that you might like to play as well. So, let's take a look at the, uh, the very first, well, the first thing that's in the game, this isn't actually new necessarily to Elite Dangerous Horizons from as different from Elite Dangerous, but they have excellent visuals and amazing sound design. I'm not actually going to score those because while those are important for the game nowadays, those are kind of almost expected. They're almost like the you know sort of the the standard. So we'll give we'll take those for granted. Actually, good uh, visuals, good sound design, and actually take a look at the specific gameplay elements that make this game enjoyable for me and what will hopefully make it enjoyable for you if you're considering buying it. <clears throat> um, uh, I will say fanboy alert, by the way. Uh, I did. I have been in, this, in Elite Dangerous since the premium beta, so I have been in the growth of the of the game since the very beginning. And I've been really impressed over the of over you know the year and a half or whatever that's been going on. Um, it has its failings, of course, and we will talk about those later. So anyway, fanboy warning out of the way. Let's talk about what's in the game reasons to play. First off, first category, great multiplayer multiplayer with lots of modes. Um, <clears throat> and all those modes have an impact on the same galaxy. I gave that uh, an overall, this category, an overall score of 17 points out of 20. And we'll go that point by point. The first point is that there's a huge open play universe out there. You can just join, be in open play, and you're in the galaxy with however many other people are in open play. You know, tens of thousands of people or whatever it is. So I give that a 5 out of 5. Um... You also have private group play. So if you actually get yourself into a private group, um, you can play and be match made and only actually see those commanders, those real players that are in your same private group. And a private group can be quite huge. So that's actually a really neat feature to have. Uh, it allows you to have a lot more flexibility on how exactly you want to play the game and what types of play you want to expose yourself. So I gave that also a 5 out of 5. Um, I give a 4 out of 5 to the Wings feature. The Wings feature is available in both open play and private group play, you, where you are able to, you know, have a, a handful of people get together in basically a space, of, uh, a space version of a party, <clears throat> like you would in World of Warcraft or something else, and uh, fly around together and do missions together, do combat together, do trade runs together, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a really neat feature to have. It's a, it's a smidge clunky to use and get used to as far as getting your friends uh, set up and things like that. But once you understand it and use it, the Wings feature is really, 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 really fun. Um, <clears throat> I give three points to built-in voiceover IP. In this case, the, the built-in voiceover IP, it, yeah, it's voiceover IP and it's built-in. Um, and you can use it with your Wings or just, you know, chatting with people that you that you know. Um, honestly, though, people will probably favor whatever voiceover IP their particular group is going to use in group play. And, um, you know, it's not the best built-in voiceover IP I've ever seen. It's average, so that's why I gave it three points. Um, <clears throat> of honorable mention, now this isn't getting any points. It's something that was available in the base game, uh, basically, is solo play. You can, uh, when the first game first came out, you had the option of playing in either open or closed, essentially. Open or solo play. In solo play, you're the only player ship in the universe. You're only dealing with NPCs, but your play still has an impact on the overall galaxy. That's been in there since the very beginning, um, and is not particularly unique to Elite Dangerous Horizon, so I didn't give that a score. Once again, this category gets 17 points out of 20. 
The other uh, big thing uh, that Elite Dangerous offers <clears throat> is that you have a lasting impo uh, impact on the galaxy, and no matter which mode you're playing in. So that's, I'm giving an overall score of 16 out of 20, as we watch my ship struggle against gravity here. <laughs> so we're actually watching old footage of, of, of uh, uh, Let's Play I was doing a while ago while I'm doing this review, just to have some background images. Um, so you have a lasting impact on the galaxy, which is 16 points out of 20. The power play uh, free feature that they introduced in uh, last year is really, really cool. I haven't personally gotten into it much, but it basically takes a lot of major factions, gives them a defined area in space, and you can go and pledge your allegiance and do missions for them and actually <clears throat> have a decided influence on how that faction grows or shrinks uh, its influence within the galaxy like you get to make this help them make decisions on where to expand and where to exploit and where to defend and and that kind of stuff it's a pretty neat feature that i haven't gotten into it's very rich uh very content rich kind of thing so i gave that five points out of five another thing that i gave five points out of five is community goals these are kind of introduced they're, they're driven um, a little bit by the actual staff running the the game world, sort of. They see places where players are sort of hanging out, and they will they will go ahead and make essentially a special quest to help expand the area there. So they're if you can find them, pay attention to the news and the bulletin boards and things like that in game. It's all the stuff is available to find in game. Um, <clears throat> you can use that to actually um, help expand inhabited universe in by use of community goals so i give that a five out of five um <clears throat> i gave two points out of five to local faction changes basically if you're working in a small area and there are some local factions that have very little influence over they might have influence only in a single star system maybe two star systems um you can have an impact on their influence and eventually change the power structure of a of a particular um a particular star system but it's really really difficult to do it takes a lot of time and it's very grindy so i give that only two out of two, uh, two out of five points local markets can be heavily influenced <clears throat> and that's just simply done by doing massive trade runs if you snag up all the platinum from a particular system and run it all and and uh sell a sell a bunch of platinum to a system that has high demand and suddenly they're flush with platinum then their demand is going to go down and you will see um you will see th their influence decrease or the, the, the market price change um, to where the next person who makes that same platinum run will both have to, one, pay higher prices for the platinum from the source system and two, um, get less money for delivering the stuff. So you, have a, you ha can have an influence over markets. They reset over time and space is huge. So if you're in a dried up market, go somewhere else. Um, so I give that a four out of five because you, you can influence local markets, but you can always find a fresh market if you just do a little bit of digging. The next category talks about a galaxy full of open space and airless bodies to explore. And this one I'm giving the, the most points to. This one, or this sort of category or feature set earned 19 out of 20 points. <clears throat> the first part is that inhabited space is huge. It's gigantic, and there is plenty to do in the inhabited space. Um, this, there was less to do before, uh, before Horizons came out, but there's a lot more stuff now. So I'm giving that five out of five with the, just a sheer expanse of, of space and areas to work in and stuff to do. Um, I'm giving four points out of five. <clears throat> this is the one little ding here we got. Four points out of five. For a good assortment, I'm keep on looking at my camera rather than or my my face instead of my camera. A good assortment of different mission types. <clears throat> so um, the assortment of mission types could be a little bit better, and I think they're still working on some more ideas. But anyway, I give that a four out of five. Uh, there's a little bit of a weakness to that that we'll talk about later. Um, five out of five points given to the fact that inhabited planets now um, and explorable. Um, uh, explorable airless bodies roughly doubles the amount of content that's available from the base game. So if you buy Elite Dangerous and without Horizons, you're only seeing half the content. 
get Elite Dangerous, Dangerous Horizons to see the entire thing. So I give that five points out of five. Another five points out of five is the fact that of the vast hugeness that is inhabited space, it still represents a pinprick in the uh, entire explorable galaxy. And we're talking stars, airless bodies, airless planets, airless moons, <clears throat> all sorts of stuff to actually go and explore and see. And for people who have exploring, uh, explorer uh, gear loaded on their ship, there's actually a decent amount of profit to be done for going and checking those places out and making new discoveries and then returning with that information. So that also gets a 5 out of 5 for a total of 19 out of 20. Um, the next category is sort of the flight, flight physics, I guess you could say. We have realistic-ish flight physics. Um, it's based on Newtonian physics, so there is momentum and things like that. There's a lot of wizards and sort of things that automatically help you fly your ship. Um, and, and Frontier Developments has tuned it and stuff for a particular style of gameplay, a particular set of gameplay um, <clears throat> for space combat and trading and things like that. But its, uh, it's foundation, at least, exists in real life, uh, life, real life physics. And that's <clears throat> right down to, you know, um, all the different... Well, I'll talk about the categories in, in, uh, in specific. I'll give four points out of five in that ships behave as you might expect. They tend to, to carry momentum forward before slowing down. You know, if you apply thrust in a vector, it takes a little while to accelerate to a speed and stuff like that. The reason I only give it four points out of five it is, is it isn't fully Newtonian physics. There are speed limits that your ship just won't exceed no matter how you have it geared out and how much thrust you apply, and that's not how the universe actually works, um, <clears throat> and stuff like that. But, you know, it, it again, it makes for a playable game. Uh, there are some times when, when I was playing Frontier once upon a time where some of their physics didn't make any sense, even though it was fully Newtonian. Um, I give five points out of five where, especially working with planets, that ships struggle under gravity. If you're in a high G world, 1.0 or 1.5 or uh, G's, I think 1.25 is the highest G I've particularly landed on. Your ship becomes harder to control as it uh, its you know autopilot or flight assist basically works to compensate for the fact that there's gravity to deal with. So as you're flying around and it's using hover engines to keep your your ship. Uh, full and level and sometimes you lose a little bit of altitude and things like that. It's really interesting to see how gravity has an impact on your ship. <clears throat> um, ships also strain against the, against the momentum to maneuver and change course. So during combat, during flying around on planets and stuff like that, your ship will carry a lot of momentum in a particular direction. And um, sometimes you'll see yourself pointing in run direction. You can s clearly see um, that you're not going that direction yet because your thrusters are still working to compensate. So I think that's really cool, and I give that a 5 out of 5. Um, <clears throat> things that I didn't assign points to because they exist in the base game and they're just totally awesome are uh, f faster than light flight still remains pretty convincing. And with the addition of planetary approaches now, it's it's actually really convincing on how they did planetary approaches to make it realistic-ish, um, but also playable. You know, unlike... <clears throat> Kerbal Space Program is, for in uh, by comparison, is... Completely realistic, except for the fact that it's a it's a toy scaled uh, solar system, which is one tenth the size of Earth. Um, but if you want to land somewhere, you have to deal with orbital mechanics. In Elite Dangerous, they sort of obfuscate that orbital mechanics away and through planetary crews and glide. And then when you get through those, you're back in a normal flight mode with speed limits and stuff like that, and with plenty of flight assist. Um, jumping to different systems is still well thought out. It's still an excellent feature. It doesn't take forever to go from system A to system B. <clears throat> and that's actually where I give four points to. Even with planetary landings, it doesn't take forever to get anywhere. If you want to land someplace on the planet, even if it's on the other side of the planet, you can actually get there relatively quickly. Um, <clears throat> and flying there doesn't yet. I've, I've been playing a good solid month now. It doesn't yet seem tedious. We'll see how uh, how that feels time go uh, time going on, but I think that's kind of one of the neat features of the game is that flying around the galaxy is actually pretty rewarding. Um, exploring airless bodies in the SRV. This is the last category that I'm going to give positive points to for my reasons to play sort of thing, and this gets a total of 17 points out of 20. 
The, as you can see on the screen here, the driving physics makes sense, so I give that a 5 out of 5. Um, you're driving with a joystick and throttle as opposed to a steering wheel, um, but, you know, it takes just a moment or two to get used to using the joystick as opposed to a steering wheel to steer around, but driving around the SRV actually, <laughs> it feels really, really good. It's really rewarding. Um, <clears throat> you know, your SRV responds to terrain realistically and things like that. Uh, such as five out of five points for slipping and sliding on icy worlds. In one of these tutorials or one of my Let's Plays, you'll probably see me driving on <clears throat> a white icy world and my SRV is sliding and losing control all over the place if I apply anything approaching speed. Um, and that's uh, really, you know, to be expected and, and actually pretty neat. Um, I give four out of five points for the SRV behaving differently on high G and low G worlds. The SRV also has and a, kind of an assist mode where it has a thruster a, a thruster pointing up or down, depending on the orientation, uh, attached to each of the wheels. And that is there to help, that is there to sort of help compensate for the forces of gravity to, to help the SRV get more, more or less traction on the wheels as needed. <clears throat> on low G wheels, those thrusters are pointing up, applying some downforce to help your SRV get more, more, um, more traction and on high G worlds those thrusters are pointed down to add just a little bit of a little bit of lightness to the uh, SRV so it doesn't get, have too much traction and weigh too much well it still weighs the same it weighs whatever it's going to weigh but um so that category give four points out of five and then in the uh, last thing in the airless bodies there's a I give three points to the fact that there is a good assortment of ground-based activities to do. So there are surface bases to explore. You can drive around. There are installations you can get to. You can leave your ship, <clears throat> go um, exploring for materials for synthesis. Um, there are data nodes you can you can capture it at every single surface base. So there's actually a fair bit of a uh, fair bit to do. I think it's an average amount of stuff to do on the surface actually. Um, a lot of it becomes more fun when you actually have multiplayer stuff going on. Now, those are all the positive points that I have assigned to this review. I'm actually going to go back through now and be a little bit brutal and take some points away because I'm a big meanie and, and uh, you know, I want to be as honest and forthcoming in this review as possible because you guys are going to be hopefully using this review to make a decision on whether or not the money invested is going to be worthwhile in playing this game. The short answer is... In my opinion, absolutely yes. If you like flying around in space, if you want to be like, like uh, Han Solo or or the uh, or the Firefly crew and uh, flying around, doing various missions and tr just trying to survive in a in a difficult, somewhat harsh, you know, somewhat harsh galaxy at times, then definitely get this game. It's absolutely worth it. Especially if you have a good control set like I do, as you can see on the video here. I have a Rhino X55. Um, but there are some reasons that some things that kind of detract from the overall gameplay um, above and beyond what I've already re reviewed. One thing that I took two points away from, minus two points, is uh, the game gets grindy at, at points. It frequently gets grindy. So you'll be do getting to a point where you've just upgraded, your, you've just gotten a new ship, you're starting to upgrade it, and you've got to do missions over and different kinds of missions over and over and over again. Do grind out trade runs that you find are profitable flying back and forth. <clears throat> um, you know, go to combat zones and do a bunch of fighting. There's a point at which there are some points at which the game is quite repetitive and grindy where you have to just do the same thing over and over again. Thankfully, the content in Elite Dangerous Horizons gives you a lot more variety of things to do. So when you get bored of a particular grind, you can change modes and go to a different grind instead. And there's more different kinds of grinds you can do than before. Um, I'm also taking away two points because despite the fact that it has the game has a good set of tutorials, if you've been watching my tutorials before, if you haven't, go check them out. If you've been watching my tutorials before, you can kind of see... There is a steep learning curve. Um, there's a steep learning curve, and you really aren't given any guidance. Like, okay, you've gone through all the tutorials, you've watched all the video, all these tutorial videos, and you fire up the game, and you're sitting in a starport. Now what? 
that's the big question. What's the first thing that you should do? Well, it turns out the first thing you should do is go to bulletin boards, but it isn't readily apparent the kind of things that you should be doing right away when you're very first starting playing some Elite Dangerous. So I'm taking two points away from that. Um, <clears throat> I'm taking one point away further for missions, actually. While there is a good variety of missions available, um, there isn't much depth in most of the mission types. Pretty much it's Here's some cargo, go deliver it. Or, <clears throat> in some cases, go find us some cargo and bring it back here. Here's a message, go deliver it. Uh, there's some more variety now. It's like, well, here's here's a mission, go deliver it to a spa uh, starport, which is in space, or a, a um, colony or something like that, which is on a planet. So there's some variety there. And there's some additional variety now in that they can have you, you know, go kill pirates in space. Or go kill... Um, rogue sentry bots on a planet somewhere. Go salvage um, some, you know, some stolen whatever, some stolen cargo from uh, an unknown signal source in space, or go salvage some stolen cargo from a point of interest on the planet. So those kind of mission types are there. There's some more variety, but um, they're not very deep. They're pretty, they're pretty much go here, get that, bring it back. There isn't a lot of story-driven content <clears throat> unless you're involved in power play or the community goals. I mentioned this before, I'm taking one point away for the steep learning curve. Um, this isn't Kerbal Space Program steep learning curve, um, but it's still pretty difficult to get started. You know, a lot of people will get their first, second, and third sidewinders blown up for silly reasons, like flying into a starport without first asking for docking clearance, and then you realize, oh, I should ask for docking clearance first. Thankfully, the game is, while brutal, it's like, you congratulations, you blew up your ship. They have an insurance policy, and if you're in your starting Sidewinder, you can, get all, you can get past all that learning curve without having to pay any money because you always get a free Sidewinder back <clears throat> um, when you uh, respawn. Um, minus one point. Another minus one. Part of the purchase price for Elite Dangerous Horizons... You know, I am, I am reviewing this game essentially on what is available right now. Um, Frontier Developments has been good about delivering on their promises, more or less. There are some things that they've over-promised and under-delivered. But <clears throat> given what is in the game, the game is definitely worth it. However, I will say I'm, I am taking away one point because part of what you're paying for when you buy Elite Dangerous Horizons is the continued development throughout the year on Elite Dangerous Horizons for some additional content that's coming in the near future. Who knows exactly what that uh, content is? There's no roadmap. There's no sort of guide saying when that content is out. They have some information out there as far as what they want to do, but we really honestly don't know when that's going to happen. So with that said, I'm taking one point away for that. Um, and honestly, just reviewing this game as it stands right now for the price that it is, rather than <clears throat> the pie in the sky um, sort of promises that are coming in the corner. I, I don't think they're pie in the sky promises. I think front-end development is largely going to deliver what they're promising, um, or at least, you know, a, a basic implementation of what they want to deliver. But I'm reviewing what we have available right now, today, when you plug it in and play and you get your joysticks all set up. You're not buying a game for what's coming out soon. You're buying a game for what's available right now. So that's what I'm reviewing for you guys. Um, I'm taking away one point because the pricing scheme is a little bit awkward. <clears throat> we in the large video game buying community world are used to buy, buying a base game, occasionally paying separately for an expansion, and in some cases, like World of Warcraft, which is hugely popular, um, you know, paying a monthly subscription fee. So you have, buy the game, pay a monthly fee, every once in a while buy an expansion, pay, buy a paid expansion if you want new content. Or StarCraft II, you know, buy, buy the game, buy an expansion, buy another expansion. You know, that those, those kinds of things are the types of things that we're sort of getting used to. We're getting more and more used to... Um, Buy the game, which has a, a good amount of content to begin with, and the game delivers new content over time, like Euro Truck Simulator, which is drive over most of Europe. Um, you know, they implemented a fair amount of Europe, and then 
boom, an expansion comes out for Eastern Europe. Boom, an expansion comes out for Scandinavia. Boom, an expansion comes out for, uh, you know, another little purchasable things for additional physics, like all the little bits and baubles you can have inside your cab and various decorations. So we're kind of used to that pricing scheme. Elite Dangerous' pricing scheme is a little strange. You can buy the base game for 15 bucks, or you can buy Elite Dangerous Horizons, which includes the base game, for 60 bucks, I think is what it is, basically US. Um, so you can buy Elite Dangerous for 15 bucks, or Elite Dangerous Plus Horizons for 60 bucks. Um, if you already have Elite Dangerous, you have to buy the full, full Elite Dangerous Horizons for 60 bucks to get it. However, right now, as of this recording, and I don't know how much long it's, longer it's gonna last, they are giving current customers of Elite Dangerous a loyalty discount of 15 bucks, which is the current purchase price of just the base game, um, <clears throat> towards Elite Dangerous Horizon. That still gives you a sticker of 45 bucks. Um, that might seem a little high, and I just I fold my arms and get all defensive. That might seem a little high for an expansion. World of Warcraft expansions tend to run 30 bucks. Um, but if you consider that in World of Warcraft, not only do you get this expansion, you're paying 15 bucks a month or so, 10 to 15 bucks a month in a subscription fee, an additional $45 for essentially doubling your content with a whole new set of features is pretty reasonable. Um, as it stands right now, once again, I'm reviewing the game as it's available. If you are brand new to Elite Dangerous and thinking about getting Elite Dangerous, skip the base game. Get Elite Dangerous Horizons. You buy it once. It's included. But the pricing scheme, like I said, is a little fuzzy. It's not like you don't need to buy Elite Dangerous and then buy Elite Dangerous Horizons. In this case, you choose which product you want to get. Elite Dangerous, 15 bucks. No Horizons expansion. Elite Dangerous with Horizons, 60 bucks. Includedly dangerous. So, you know, that's a little awkward in the store to kind of figure out for people to sort of intuitively know what's going on. Anyway, so that's kind of why I'm giving taking away one point. So, I took away a total of eight points. Basically, if I look up at the top of my thing here, based on all the positive reasons I've added to the game, um, Great multiplayer, open play, private bring, private group play, wings, built-in voice over IP, lasting impact on the galaxy with power play community goals, local faction changes influencing local markets, uh, galaxy o -O -O full of open space and airless bodies to explore with, an, uh, with a huge set of inhabited space with plenty to do, a good assortment of different mission types, inhabited planets doubling the content from the base game and inhabited space being a pinprick in the overall galaxy. Uh, we have realistic-ish physics, with ships behaving as you might expect, ships struggling under gravity, ships straining against momentum and maneuvering to change course, and it doesn't take forever to get anywhere. Airless bodies explore exploration in the SUV with good driving physics, SRV slipping and sliding on icy worlds, SRV behaving differently on high G and low G worlds, and a good assortment of ground-based activities, those are all the positives, taking away the fact that it gets grindy sometimes, it's hard to know where to begin. Missions have a good variety, but not a lot of depth. There's a steep learning curve, Part of the purchase price has future features built in, but that's not what I'm reviewing. However, I'm taking away a point. Um, and that the pricing scheme is a little bit awkward. We end up with a grand total ooh, ooh, of 79 points out of 100. So if I were uh, a big executive at a big executive magazine, you know, giving the big numbers on the screen, it would be seven, 79 out of 100 um points which is a good solid game with a good solid purchase uh, purchase price potential i recommend this if you want to basically spend your spare time knowing what it's like or spend some of your spare time knowing what it's like to have a job in space look at this we're, we're flying through space right now um this is this is super cruise we're actually flying at what is that 10 times the speed of light and currently slowing down to our destination you know it's um this is interplanetary travel within the same solar system, but you've probably seen, if you've been watching this thing, uh, me hyperspacing about to various systems, landing on planets and doing stuff like that. So that's, um, that's Elite Dangerous Horizons in a nutshell from <clears throat> an unsolicited review. 
giving you points of information as straightforwardly and honestly as I can. Um, I hope this helps you decide where you want to put your money, and maybe I'll see you guys online. So until then, commanders, I will say keep flying and stay shiny. Goodbye.